Welcome back, everyone. Data Innovation Summit 2023. We're back with another uh, product demonstration and uh, uh, description. I'm joined by Cloudera. <laughs> Please introduce yourself and tell me what am I going to? What are we going to hear about? Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about innovation in our platform. And uh, my name is Wim Stope. I'm the senior director of Hybrid Data Platform. Um, uh, yeah, so we got a lot of things going on in our platform, lots of, uh, lots of new projects. I want to talk about what they are and why they are relevant. I brought a few slides. Okay. We're going to race through them and hopefully we'll have a chance to do a bit more of a chat as well. All right, let's see so, it. Let's go, right? So when I, when I think about the platform that we have, it is built on four key pillars. And uh, the pillars are you need to be able to, to, to support modern data architectures, the, the blueprints and the paradigms that help you get to grips with more data faster. So that's the data mesh, the data lake house, and data fabric. Mm. Um, then it's also, you need to be able to, to deploy a platform across hybrid cloud. It's a fact of life. Everyone has got more than one infrastructure. You need to have data services, analytics, that will seamlessly work between these different infrastructures to support these different architectures. And you need to be able to do that with consistent security and governance. But for now, for today, I just want to zoom into the data lake house. Because the data lake house is a, is a tremendous concept. It, it solves an awful lot of problems. It brings together and it bridges the gap between a separate data warehouse with a separate data lake house. So as the definition uh, states, it, it unifies that data warehouse and the data lake, aiming to support that whole range of analytical capabilities, not just one storage structure for one analytic. And the data lake house, it tries to solve these, these challenges. It, it solves the challenges of having to maintain two different stores of data, because then the moment you, you have one updated, the other one's out of date, it's stale. You, you need to do things in multiple different places, multiple different times, so you have reliability issues. You also have one place you need to go in order to do one kind of analytic and another for another. And as a result, it drives your cost up. You need to duplicate data, you need to duplicate processes. It just costs a lot. So the four key design goals of a data lake house are these. But how do you actually build a better data lake house? Right. Right? You need to make sure that it works with anything. It works with any kind of analytic, any functionality, on any infrastructure, and that's the second bit. It needs to be able to work consistently the same way everywhere. But then lastly, wherever it's deployed, however it works, it always needs to work best. So across these three dimensions, I'll be talking about some of the innovation that we're bringing in as part of the platform. The first one is, how do you make it work with anything, with any analytic, and for that? We use Iceberg. You may have heard of the of the project before. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a project that was started by Netflix in in 2018. It it became a top level foundation project in 2020, and it is seen as the the, the next generation cloud native table format. And as a result, we also recognize the it, its dominance in, in the no, not dominance. Uh, its desirability in the, right. the community mm -hmm. um, and, and use it for our purposes, which is really about driving that flexibility. There is a complete separation of, of, of the various partitions. It's completely hidden for the end users. Schemas can be evolved. It works on, on any data warehouse operations. It's fully asset compliant, but it has very cool features that allows you to do, to do time travel and rollback, to, to ask for what the results are from a particular query at a particular point in time. But most importantly, it works with masses and masses on data, petabyte scale data with incredible performance. So with Iceberg, you can start to address some of the challenges that previously with, with just a data warehouse or just a data lake were completely impossible. Uh, you, can, you can make sure that you meet your requirements from a uh, data protection and data regulation perspective the, the right to be forgotten, for example, as part of GDPR. You can make sure that you can use petabytes upon petabytes of data for either traditional analytics, but also what we're looking to do, and we're talking about it here in the conference, machine learning. Machine learning uh, for any models, and, and even large language models. Right. But equally, historical reporting. To, to have the ability to go back to a particular point in time and say, this is what the answer to that question was. 
This is exactly what Iceberg offers. And we have a couple of customers that are using this with tremendous effect. There is the uh, financial service organization that was just required by law to be able to answer that question, what, what was your state at that particular time? So time travel allowed them to meet their needs from a regulatory compliance perspective. There's a system software organization. They just spent more than six hours just updating their data warehouse. And while they were updating it, they couldn't actually query it. They couldn't use it. As a result, because you now have automatic snapshotting, you can just query your data while new data is being loaded in. You can have near real-time analytics. And then the last one is a, a car manufacturer. Uh, Self-driving cars, it requires a tremendous amount of data, but also car production. It generates a tremendous amount of data. How can you still maintain performance when you're dealing with such volumes? Well, Iceberg allows you to do just that. So that was the first one. How do you make it work with any analytics at scale? But then the second one is, how do you make this work everywhere? Right. Because so far, I think the majority of people listening will have thought, well, this is good, it's public cloud, right? It's a yeah. scale. Yeah, when they say everywhere, they actually mean everywhere as long as it's uh, these three <laughs> yes. public clouds. <laughs> yes, but what if, you, what if you are very security conscious, you're very highly regulated, and you want to make this work on-premises? Well, then you need an on-premise object store, and Ozone is that on-premise object store. It's, it's another Apache project to provide, uh, provide the ability to deal with structured and unstructured data at any scale for any applications. The purpose is to, to make this accessible. But, and here is the kicker, it helps you drive tremendous scale, it helps you drive tremendous performance, so supporting also the iceberg performance. Looking at the, the, the benchmark blog that we have on that, for example, you see how Ozone uh, performs better in, in some of the benchmarking that we have. It provides you the ability to have much denser storage nodes, four times denser than what traditionally on-premise you would do with HDFS. Yeah. It scales millions upon millions, billions of objects, which is another limitation that HDFS has. It's easier to manage, it's very resilient, it's much faster to, to restart if there is a failure. And as a result, you also have a much lower cost per terabyte because it's not just the storage density, there's yeah. also the uh, the, the operation and management that you can, you can reduce your costs on. Can I ask a question? I mean, Please. what we're seeing, uh, well, we had a panel here just a moment ago, we're talking about these uh, data wells where there's so much data in them that it's just uh, uh, too cumbersome to move it between platforms. Instead, you build up a new one and start populating it, and then you just let this one sort of die right. out. But imagine you're a telco and you have OpenShift, or maybe you have stuff in the cloud on Azure Blob mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, is it possible to interoperate? Do you have to move it over to Ozone, or can you read from those storage areas as well? How is the interoperability? I'll come to just that in the next slide. All right. Because as I do my comparison with HDFS, when I talk about the, the, the storage density rather than 100 terabytes per node, 400 terabytes, the, the scalability, the, the billions of objects versus millions, the the startup and recovery, active, active, this last element here, that's yeah. important. Because for HDFS, you have the Hadoop API, right. but when it comes to Ozone, you have not just the Hadoop API, you also have the S3, S3. compatibility. So that way, you can, you can use it in so many different ways. Right, so as long as you're storing your stuff with an S3 com compatible API, you're good to exactly. go. Exactly, exactly. Nice. Which was also one of the reasons why, of course, Ozone is so attractive for, for many organizations. Right, and that's so, because in true a data lake uh, or, or a lake house fashion, they are decoupled in a, in a way that's, that's actually decoupled so that when you do storage access, given that it's using S3 as an access protocol, right. it doesn't necessarily have to be your S3. It could be you exactly. know, a blob storage somewhere yep. or whatever is S3 compatible, yep. they could access. And, and that way you can, you can move your data as and when needed. You can let one right. well dry out and the other one fill up again. Right, right. Exactly the scenario you just painted. Okay, okay. Right? So that's on Ozone, but then the last thing, so okay, we can do these data lake houses, we can do them in public cloud, we can do them in private cloud, we can do them anywhere, but how do you make sure that this complexity actually always works best? That is the last element that I want to talk about, and there is a tool that we have in Cloudera's toolkit which is called Workload XM, Workload Experience Manager. Okay. Because if you think about workloads, deployments of, of, of platforms, deployments of data across hybrid cloud, there are many different moving parts. There are so many right. different services, cogs, operational uh, resources that are allocated. 
How do you keep track of that? It, it's a big challenge for an organization and it sucks up an awful lot of resource. But not only that, how do you allocate resource and cost resources to, for example, a use case or to a team? That's an accounting exercise. Yeah. And as, as you no doubt have heard, more and more organizations becoming very conscious about financial governance around their, their operational, uh, operational systems. This is something that you need to get a handle on as well. But then lastly, in such a complex system, if something goes wrong, if a query doesn't perform today like it did yesterday, how do you find out what the, the root cause for that is? That takes a long time as well. You need to go through many different logs. You need to look at many different statistics. It sounds like an octopus would be really good at something like that, right? Right, right. Okay, how do you address these challenges? Well, we address these challenges with Workload Manager because it gathers the telemetry, it gathers the operational insight of anything that is happening and going on in, in your deployed estate, in your lake house. Hmm. It analyzes that data, it allows you to do, uh, to, to do monitoring, it allows you to do analytics from a historical perspective, you can start to predict the future requirements that you have, but it also recognizes when things aren't working the way that they should, why that query is running slower. Yeah. And here is our suggestion based on our experience, our combined experience from support from engineering, professional services, on how you actually make this better. Right. But ultimately, it let you manage that whole estate. So this is something where you can put a price on resources consumed by your workload and allocate them to a cost center. So you get a grip on not just the current cost, but also can start to plan for future cost. Now, doing that, it gives you tremendous benefits. There is, there is improved use of your, of your resources. You effectively, you find that you have you have free capacity, and you can do other things with it. You can, you can run more analytics to get more insight and value from your data. You can make sure, because the system knows how much capacity is needed, it can automatically scale up, automatically scale down. You can adhere to your SLAs and SLOs so that your business users, when they do need the insights, they get them exactly when they need it. Yeah. But then also, if things do go wrong, you're 50 times faster at just finding that root cause. Found the root cause, now you can do something about it. Uh, and there is, there is no more tracking logs, tracing logs, and so on. So, Well, I mean, there's something to be said about, I was trying to sneak a peek here at some of the, the, the advice that was given to what kind of errors you could get. Yeah. It's pretty cool to be able to, to track uh, performance issues and that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and that relates to the cost of the system, but just being able to map out the cost is uh, something that I don't think a lot of people consider uh, and understand how much potential it, it brings. So one of the coolest features that I liked about Azure because it was very early with it was the ability to, first of all, separate uh, subscriptions so that one cost center is associated with one mm -hmm. subscription yep. and the other clouds hadn't really caught up with that. Yep. And it was really nice because it was very evident that you're spending all the money for your utilization. And I know there are a lot of tools that, that let you do uh, sort of data platform stuff, but the, the cost management part is important to me, the way it's done here, because uh, you want your data science projects to be justified by the value that they're going to produce outwards. Yep. So this is a cash flow issue, right? You have a resource that's, that's costing you money, yep. and there is no tech debt as long as your cash flow is positive. Yep, that is absolutely You can always the improve the margins and make yep. it more efficient sure. by troubleshooting sure. it. Yep. But, but this cost calculation has always has to be there. Yep. And the fact that you guys have a tool for that, I think is very cool. Uh, we do have a tool for it, I've got something more on that later. Uh, so, but just to come back to what we set out, right? How, mm. do, you, how do you build a better data lake house? Well, you, you build a better data lake house by making sure that it, it deals with any analytics on any data. And we do that through Iceberg as part of our platform. We make it work everywhere, or rather we provide the equivalent capability on-premises as you would have in public cloud mm -hmm. through Ozone. And then finally, and I don't think you, you find many, many tools that are out there, we make it always work best. Mm -hmm. The best possible it can be, the, the optimal use of resources. So this is what we do in our platform and this is how we innovate. But there is one kicker, there is something I can't quite talk about it until we get to the middle of June. Okay. So I'd like to invite the, uh, the audience, I'd like to invite them to, uh, to register now for our Cloud Era Now event happening on the 14th of June. 
where I'll be able to talk a little bit more about the evolution of this Workload XM that we just spoke about. All right. Moving in the direction of observability. Is Workload XM and the future of that, is that, would you say that's central to uh, a lot of the value proposition that's that's sort of being pushed forward right I now? Think it, I think it is a next iteration for, for, for not just Cloudera, but for many organizations. Mm -hmm. to, we, we know we can do data, we know we can do analytics, we can do it at scale. Yeah, some of it can do it a bit faster than others, mm -hmm. but how do you do it more efficient? Right. The next, the next iteration of of efficiency for organizations in speed, in cost savings. So yeah, observability, applied observability, is the next big thing, and and we've got some great news coming up on that. I, ha I happen actually to have uh, gotten a sneak peek, or uh, maybe some uh, some some hints at which direction things are headed in, and so uh, I think this is going to be a pretty fun event. So I urge you all to log in and check it out. I want to hear your opinions on. You mentioned that cost cost management is a thing, and we were talking at a panel here before about how much should be done within the, let's say the platform management group and how much responsibility should be pushed out to the organizations. And you know, normally, when you're doing things as a group, you notice that there are scale benefits to centralizing things. So yep. it starts off distributed, and then you're like, well, we're all printing paper, why don't we get a printer together, and then, yeah. right? Yeah. But for some reason here with IT, a lot of times things are done the opposite. You'd get something, and then you try to get people reasons to use the centralized resource. Yeah. How do you see that dynamic playing out right now and what role does Cloudera play in the push outwards or pull inwards yeah. that's happening right yeah. now in data platforms? So, so not just talking about, uh, about this, the, the, this innovation that we have here, but talking more about applying the platform. There are some great paradigms in that and I'm specifically thinking about the data mesh where organizations, as you say, traditionally, IT has centralized things and, and the, the business lines of business have come to IT and say, can I have, have you got? We want to split that, we want to decentralize it, we want to pull it apart, we want to make individual domains the experts of the data, we want to give them the ability but also the responsibility to do what they do best, which is work with their data, provide their data as a product. It allows the organization as a whole to be an awful lot more agile and flexible and, and get to data inside and value faster. But here is the thing, it, need, it needs to be the, the platform that IT provides to support that. Which is why when I look at what are some of the key principles for success in doing that inside an organization, you need to be aware of the changing landscape. You need to be aware of this needs to happen in a hybrid infrastructure. Not hybrid infrastructure, I'm aware of I've got public cloud and, pub, and private cloud, but hybrid infrastructure as in how can I capitalize how can I take advantage of that capability? Mm. You need to be aware of these, these modern data architectures, these, these paradigms, blueprints, and accelerators. Right. And you can't just pick one, because if I say I, I'm going to build a data mesh, I need to get my data in somewhere. That's a data fabric, and I need to give the domains the ability to analyze and create that data product. That's probably a data lake house. So mm. you can't just say I'll pick the best data fabric, right. because you need a data fabric and a data lake house and a data mesh. Right. So how do you? What are the characteristics of the technology that support all of those? Yeah. And you need to do that in the context of, of rising security and compliance. Yeah. You need to be able to meet, as a multinational organization especially, you're not just dealing with one single nation, you're dealing with countries the world over that all have different approaches. How do you tackle that? So take, look at these three elements to be able to go to that decentralization with a data mesh and let IT be the heroes that say, we know what to look for in a platform from a technology perspective that right. meets the needs for all of you. Right. And then you realize you've got a cloud error. It's good to have one tool that can handle a lot of that stuff, or, or all of it, uh, because, you know, last year Data Mesh was the word of the year. Yeah. Everybody was talking about it. Nobody really wanted to admit that Data Mesh had a technology aspect to it. They were saying, it's all about governance, it's about people, it's about, love flowers and trees, but this is a tech conference, and at the end of the day, it has to hit the ground, Yeah, and there needs to be infrastructure to support that paradigm. And the, the, the key word there is support. Mm. A data mesh, indeed, it's, it's, not, it's not a technology solution. You can't go out and say, I'll, I'll have three data meshes, please. Yeah. But technology needs to support it. Yeah. There are the, 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 four, the four key principles, decentralization, data as a product, um, self-serve uh, access to infrastructure and, and analytics and the ability to have federated governance. Yeah. Well, that's not one product, but there are products that support all of right. these elements. Right. All right, this has been a really nice uh, uh, explanation.
Cloudera, one of the OGs of big data, I'd say. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, still, still uh, fighting hard, still some uh, cool developments to keep track of. I urge you all to log on and check this out. Thank you for showing us. And uh, thanks everybody for joining. We'll be back after a little break and uh, looking forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you.